All right. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? So thanks, Cliff, very much. Thanks to Dairy Business for, uh, for your partnership here in doing these. You guys, of course, are the, uh, are the early birds. Actually, our panelists, panelists, why don't you guys go ahead and come on up here while I uh, yammer on for a bit. Um, it's funny how the crowd always kind of grows as lunch approaches, um, but, uh, and, and we'll look forward to that. But uh, how are we doing? So it's Empire Farm Days, right? It's not 95 degrees, okay? It's not raining, okay? You didn't walk through three inches of mud to get to the, to the tent today, so, uh, and yes, it is Empire Farm Days, and yes, it is New York and early August and things like that. But a uh, couple quick intros before we get the panel kicked off here. Um, Again, Cliff already introduced Betsy Howland from our Pro Dairy staff here in the back. Okay, one other intro I'd like to do. I don't see some of our other, we've got uh, a couple other staff members kicking around here, Heather Darrow and Becky McPhee. Uh, they're not here right at the moment. Uh, we have a new professor at Cornell in Dairy, Dr. Julio Giordano. Julio, you can wave here. Uh, he has no friends just yet, but he'll get some in a hurry. No, I'm just, just kidding. We're his friends, but, uh, but we're up here. We should probably have him on here. Uh, but Julio's been on board now about two months. Uh, he uh, is originally from Argentina, uh, came through uh, University of Tennessee, and then University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a reproductive physiologist, so work with one of the, the key repro phys groups, really kind of that's, that's uh, Paul Fricke's group, that's really known uh, worldwide. And so uh, Julio came on board, uh, actually took, uh, Dave Galton's still around, but uh, Julio kind of assumed that, that, uh, that role in dairy management group, so we're really excited to have a uh, a new young faculty member as part of our group. So welcome Julio, and uh, he's gonna be doing some technology related stuff as you guys see over time. But right now he's just trying to figure out this whole teaching, advising, and all this other stuff thing that goes along with it. So, but uh, we're glad to have him. All right, so today's topic um, is, is technologies. And you think about technology here for a minute, of course, you know, dairies and, 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 and crop related folks have been adopting, you guys have been adopting technology for a long time, right? In, in many ways, and that's, uh, again, is how we move our industry forward. As I look at the Northeast, okay, you know, in, in particular, I think that adoption of technology um, has been one of our strengths over time, okay? That doesn't mean we can't always operate faster, right? And, and maybe than we do sometimes, but I think when I look at our Northeast dairy producer, um, you know, again, in order to achieve the efficiencies, in order to, um, to again, stay ahead of that curve, I think smart adoption of technology is, is valuable. And so Carl and I put together this panel today um, with, uh, with two dairy producers a, uh, and then uh, two uh, agribusiness professionals anyway. I guess, uh, Dave, I think you're kind of part agribusiness professional, part crop grower anyway, or, or, or producer and things like that. Um, and to, again, discuss some of the, I'd say, the trials and, and tribulations, I guess, relative to, uh, to their use of technology, how, they have, how they've made decisions to adopt what's worked for them. In some cases, what hasn't worked, right? Because, again, when you're an adopter, uh, you know, sometimes you adopt stuff and, and it doesn't always work out the way you anticipated. But I think at the end of the day, um, it still is about, about the willingness to innovate, the willingness to try things, um, et cetera. So, the way we're going to do this is, uh, is we're first going to let them each introduce themselves to you. So we're just going to go kind of right in order here. Um, and again, you guys know, know Carl Zimmick anyway as well as our field crop and nutrient management specialist at Pro Dairy. So we're going to have them introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about uh, their background and their business and kind of what they do. And then we'll dive into more of the, the meat of the panel. So Pete, would you like to start? We'll go. Good morning. Oh boy, go ahead. Morning. Uh, my name is Pete Dupengeiser. I'm a partner with my brother Mike on a 1,200 cow dairy in Wyoming County. Um, 86 graduate of Cornell, and um, we uh, farm about 2,000 acres, and um, could use a few more this year with the lack of rain. But uh, I think we'll be okay. Um, we are uh, some of the. I guess we'll get into the specifics of the technology in a minute. Um, but some of them have to do with uh, heat detection, um, heat time monitoring, rumination monitoring, and automatic calf feeding. Okay, we're also going to have uh, Pete's son, Jake, as a, as a freshman at Cornell in the fall. So we're looking forward to teaching him and then uh, assume he'll find the other fun things that are to do at college and things like that as he goes. Right, Pete? 
<laughs> okay. All right, Dr. Lindsay Peck. Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Peck. Uh, I'm, as you said, I'm a veterinarian. I have my own practice as well as being a partner at Mark's Farms. Currently, we're milking somewhere around Hold four, the mic closer, Lindsay. about 4,500 animals. We have about 5,000 head of young stock. Uh, we sell somewhere in the range of 1,500 head of young stock a year. We crop about 10,000 acres. Um, we're big, big advocates of animal welfare and various certifications on that aspect. Uh, and as far as my duties go on the farm, it's anything related with herd health, anywhere from you know just daily treatments to employee management to maintaining our extensive maternity facility. Right. Excellent. Okay, John Gloss, let's talk about your background, how you got where you are today, and uh, what you do. Good morning. I, I thought we only had a few minutes, uh, so I'll, I'll try to I'll abbreviate. I'm John Gloss. I, I'm a lead up the farm systems group at Dairy One. Um, we got our start back in the very early 90s when Jack Van Elmelo and Danny Thon teamed up with uh, Steve Eicher to begin installing and supporting Dairy Comp 305 here in the Northeast. I joined that group of folks in 93 and uh, we, in a lot of cases, brought the first computers out to our customers' farms and, and I like to say we taught them where the enter key was and it was uh, a lot of fun. One of the things we learned as we did that was when you bring the first computer out, they assume you know something about computer hardware. And uh, so we began selling and supporting computer hardware in support of that software uh, endeavor. The software stuff has continued to grow and change as the dairy industry has. And uh, we now sell and support many different software systems, which I'll refrain from naming because I'll forget one of them and somebody will be uh, upset. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll just say we have about 1,600 users right now across our different softwares, about 2,200 copies of software. Obviously, each one of those runs on a computer of some sort. Um, so the hardware enterprise has grown as well. And uh, that has branched out from being just something that we did in support of our software to having a life of its own. And, and now includes wired and wireless networks, um, handheld computers, camera systems, backup servers, and really our, our job as we see it is to help our customers get information where they need it and when they need it. Um, and that's where we spend our time. Good morning, my name is David Russell. Uh, I, I kind of have a split, split personality here. I, I have plenty of experience on the actual dairy farm. I uh, graduated Cornell in 1990 came out and started working for Southview Farm in western New York. Uh, worked on one of their facilities up until, oh, just about oh, two and a half years ago. I decided I wanted to try something a little different, so I started working for a company that is now called Agronetics, um, trying to develop some precision ag technology here in western New York. I decided uh, last year I, I liked getting my hands dirty a little too much, so I, I went back into um, managing the crop, farm, crop um, portion of the farm at uh, Southview, as well as doing uh, some work with Agronetics still. So Southview, we're uh, cropping a little over 2,000 acres and uh, mostly corn and, and forage production. Okay. Again, we introduced Carl already, so I'll just circle back here and we'll, we'll kind of dive into, dive into the meat of this thing. So Pete, we'll start with you. So tell us a little bit about what you've, you know, what technologies you've adopted, um, what's worked, uh, you know, and, and how you've gone about that whole, that whole process. Um, I guess the first one I'll mention is the, uh, the heat time system that we put in. We were having some, some challenges with... Uh, Reproduction of reproductive efficiency. We weren't happy with our heat detection. Um, maybe a variety of problems there, but um, we were on an aggressive uh, odd sync pre-sync program, and still residual heats. We weren't happy with the kind of heat detection we were getting, so we um, put in CMAX's heat time, which is an activity monitoring. It's not a pedometer. It's a 
It's a collar around the neck that's monitoring all activity. Um, so not just steps, but um, you know, head bobbing and motion and all kinds of things. We're very pleased with the system, and when we did that, we, uh, we kept half the cows on a shot program, took the other half completely off of shots, no shots at all, and went with the heat time on those cows. And for eight months, we monitored the results of that, and they were pretty close. Um, both were, were fairly successful. Um, both had their challenges. So what we decided, and over time, this is, we're talking three years' time now, what we've come down to now is we're still on a very aggressive pre-sync, odd-sync program with residual heats being picked up by heat time. And that seems to be the best fit. My goal was really no more shots. I didn't want to give shots. And I don't think, at least in our case, in our herd, that you can have exceptional reproductive efficiency without that shot program in our herd. So we, were, we went back to the pre-sync, odd-sync, and then use heat time to pick up residual heats. We use ultrasound. Our, our herd manager is trained to, uh, to check pregnancy with ultrasound, so we're doing that, and then um, that helps us to, to shorten up that interval. And heat time's doing a great job with picking up those residual heats. So that seems to be the best fit in our case. Uh, we're quite pleased with that. Um, in addition to that, they came up with, uh, the heat time folks came up with a, a rumination component to the collars. So what it is doing, there's a microphone inside of that uh, little um, collar and it keeps track of the time, the, the number of time, minutes a day that the cow ruminates. And we were one of the first herds to have that in and so we didn't have everybody on it. But uh, w now we have everybody that's pre-fresh, so three weeks pre-calving to at least three week to four weeks post-calving because we don't have all our collars, don't have this the rumination monitoring. And I was just talking with Tom uh, before. I think there's a world of opportunity with this technology. The way we're using it currently is pretty much to identify cows um, what it does is build a standard for ruminations for each cow because there's a great deal of variability in individuals. The herd, total herd on average, ruminates about eight hours, eight and a third hours a day, 500 minutes. But averages don't do much for you because there's a great deal of variation among cows. So it builds a standard over a week or 10 days for that individual cow. And then it will give us a report if that cow's ruminations are down. And you can, there's lots of flexibility in how much you want to see, if you want to see them down a little bit, or whatever, however you want to build that, the sensitivity into it, you can. But it has really helped us to see cows that are trending down off feed. It has also really been good when we make a, a change in the pre-fresh or fresh group, we can see ruminations changing. So that's, that's how we're using it now. But I said to Tom, I think there's a lot more that can be done with this technology. Um, we just need some smart guys like Tom and others to, I said that, Tom, so you're good to my son when he gets there. Um, so we can do more with that system. But it, it really has helped us to identify cows that are beginning to go off for whatever reason. Um, the other one I'll just mention hey, is Pete, uh, we Pete, also... Pete, quick question. Uh, so just real quick follow-up on the, on the ruminant. So have you replaced other aspects of your fresh cow monitoring uh, program be, with you know because of use of, of here or, or are you pretty much doing some of the things you were doing before as, as well I we haven't been quite gutsy enough to just you know quit looking at fresh cows and go with the rumination monitoring but what it does do is the herd manager comes in that's the first thing he looks at so he knows if there's cows that he's got to make sure you know we're, we're really honing in on watching closer so from that standpoint maybe intensified you know, his time on, on the proper cows. Okay. Okay. The other um, thing that we have done is um, put in a automatic calf feeding uh, last November. Uh, we built a new barn for 200 head. Uh, 100 would be on the feeders and 100 wean calves. Um, that, that is going quite well. We're just finishing up a trial now with um, 
a couple grain companies to look at growth weights and hip heights and body length and that kind of thing. The data is just beginning to come in on that. Looks very promising. Uh, we're, we're very excited about that technology as well. I won't say a lot about it. If there's questions, we can entertain those uh, later. We also are using GPS in our cropping system, both for planting corn and also on the hay cutting machine in order to make that more efficient. So I'll just leave it at that. here under the bus just a little bit so and I but Lindsay knows this I John and I met to talk about who from the herd side would also be be good and somebody they've worked with before quite a bit and uh, and uh, Lindsay and uh, and uh, and Jackie at Mark's farm again really kind of were the first ones that John brought to the table of course mom but mom kind of volunteered daughter to do this today so uh, so so sometimes those things happen right Lindsay so so Lindsay why don't you go ahead and talk about some of the things you, you guys have done uh, so first off, I'll start off with our RFID system. Um, for those that don't know, it's an electronic ID system. Uh, we've been doing it for a couple of years now, and it, through trial and error, we started off with a basic ankle transponder years ago. Um, you know, I don't know if technology wasn't quite there yet for you. Know, there was a lot of breaking down, batteries dying. They were very expensive. Uh, several years ago, we switched to a microchip, which didn't hold up either. It's just uh, basically the same thing that they put in your dogs when you take them to the vet, a little glass chip, and they would break you know, within months. Uh, so currently, we're using just an ear button, and every head, of, you know, every head on our farm has an uh, electronic ID. Everything gets scanned in uh, with a wand into a Palm Pilot. Uh, everything is done basically at cow side. So, you know, you're out in the herd, all of the, you know, vet checks, you know, we were preg checking somewhere around 800 to 1,000 head a day. Everything is done right on those palm pilots, entered in with the wand, downloads into the palm, and then into our dairy comp system. All of our treatments are daily, you know, for fresh cows, sick cows, all of that's entered in on, on cow side as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, sort of that. You know, it, it has just cut, you know, our time of, you know, you know, data entry and the guys be, being familiar with the system. Every person that works on our herd, you know, currently it's about 20, 20, 25 people, um, American and Hispanic. They all know how to work this uh, this system. It's fairly easy, I think, especially with uh, the younger generation. If you can work a smartphone, you can work this this system. Uh, a lot of actually our smartphones, we can bring up our cow cards. So if you're out in the herd and you're walking, you're like, boy, that cow doesn't look right. Let's pull her up. Her, our, her card is right there. You know, you can see what's happened, where she's in lactation, um, you know, if you, if you need to do things with her or not. Um, uh, and, you know, we were kind of talking a little bit before, beforehand. The, the biggest thing, I think, for us and you know, having such a you know, large number of animals is, your records have got to be perfect, and especially in this day and age with FDA and the regulations, you really need to stay on top of things. And I think without being the, the ability to enter things specifically right as they happen, uh, you know, this paper records is really you know, going to the wayside here you know, as of late. Um, as for challenges wise, I think that, you know, with any technology, you, you get, you know, a few challenges here and there, some software glitches. Um, but John's always there to <laughs> give us a hand. Um, and like I said, I, I per, personally, I think, you know, it's easy and I love doing it and it makes my life much easier. Um, the older generation maybe struggles a little bit at first, but it, it, they, they adapt it quite easily. Um, and I, the, the only other thing I'll mention is our pre precision feeding system that we started in March. Uh, I'm just going to barely touch base with that. But so basically, it's a feeding system that we have embedded into our loaders that we load the, the feed with and stuff in the morning. There's an automatic um, uh, sampling done with every load so we can more closely monitor what is actually being fed to the animals. It is greatly dis um, decreased our waste. So it basically paid for itself within the first couple of months. Um, uh, and I guess that's about it. As a side benefit of sitting up here with colleagues and customers, um, they're plowing a lot of ground for me ahead of time. 
just to talk a little bit about the handheld RFID technology that Lindsay was talking about, I, I think it takes us, our herd management, from to a, to a new level of process control. Uh, the lists and things that go out to the handheld are specific for jobs that need to be done. Um, in most cases, we're doing multiple jobs in one pass, whether it's uh, vet checking, dry off marking, um, tagging for specific other actions. As the cows are scanned, the handheld tells us what to do, and, and it increases compliance, the likelihood that we're going to get the right job done to the right cow. It's also very quick. Um, so it does save time, allows us to make, do multiple things in one pass, and it's relatively easy uh, to use. It's uh, so easy they even taught me to do it. Um, our experience has been you take someone out and you hand it to them and you show them how to use it for about 10 minutes and you can pretty much walk away. The one key thing that we need, and I, I think this is true with any technology, is we need somebody at the farm who's a champion who says, this is going to work, one way or the other. Um, the RFID handheld technology here in the Northeast is a great example. We have a lot of six-row barns, and how many people have enough headlocks for every cow? <laughs> exactly. So when that technology came here, it was a real non-starter. Um, we just couldn't find anybody to even try it. And, and I'm a heck of a salesman, and I still couldn't get anybody to try it until finally a, a, a herds person out in western New York said, you know, I've got some extra time on my hands. Um, I think I'm going to try to make that work. And they figured out how to make it work in six row barns and, and helped us learn how to do that. But that person just said, look, it's going to work. And when there was a hiccup, um, instead of saying, ah, oh, this thing doesn't work and putting it down and walking away from it, he grabbed it and picked up the phone and called us and said, how do we make this work? And he learned the three or four tricks to make it work. So that's a really important part of any technology is just to have that, have that piece there. And the only other thing I'll add is if you're considering doing anything with handheld RFID technology, the cows really have to be restrained. Um, I know we do a lot of work out in the free stalls where cows aren't locked up still, and that, that just won't fly well with RFID stuff. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was just heifer weights and getting those automated and incorporated into your herd management system. We have systems that will um, use uh, TrueTest or Digi Digistar scales, we've done both now, that allow us to capture that, bring it into Dairy Comp 305 and apply that to the cow's record and begin calculating average daily gains, incremental average daily gains, and giving us feedback as to what's going on with the heifers and how they're growing. and, and if we're making changes, are they good changes or bad changes? Um, I think that there's a real opportunity for us there. There's some concerns with that, obviously, facilities. You have to have a place to put the, the chute. Um, again, we need that champion at the farm that says it's going to work because all this technology stuff is great, but it does break and it does have its little glitches. And um, if you come down to our booth at, uh, at the dairy tent, We'll show you just how it all works perfectly until you walk out of the booth with it in your hand. And then things happen. And that's true with any technology. So we need a person at the farm that does that. And the other thing I wanted to mention, which is just tangential really to, to dairy um, software, is weather stations. Um, dairy One has begun uh, supporting fields and crops software, which is a uh, nutrient management and uh, crop planting software. And one of the things that we can attach to that is a weather station that reports rainfall, temperatures, and that sort of stuff. And it helps us be CAFO compliant. Um, and that's been something that, is, as we talk to people, they've been quite interested in. So I wanted to be sure to mention that today. And that, of course, as Dave will tell us, has absolutely no trouble at all. Right, Dave? Uh, we're going to switch gears now, right? So uh, over to the crop side, and, and Dave, again, a lot of experience here, both uh, your, your own personal experience, but then also experience working with others, too. So why don't you? Sure. So I'll, I'll try to work in a little of both. Um, in my experience with technology, kind of obviously we've been using uh, different forms of it in the dairy industry on the cropping side, but... As Tom mentioned in his introduction, I found that uh, the adoption of technology on the cropping side on the, in the dairy industry has, has been somewhat slower than what um, I think you'd find in most row crop 
um, farms in the Midwest, um, the cows get priority on a dairy, and they should. But uh, I think there's some opportunities out here now for us to increase our efficiencies on the crop side. Um, I started using uh, some GPS technology when I was at Sparta Farm. Um, we wanted to go to zone tillage for uh, agronomic reasons. Our equipment didn't line up. Our tillage pass and our uh, pointer pass were different widths. And that uh, kind of dictated that we, we needed to go to some sort of guidance. So we got into GPS. Um, and I think that's where most of, uh, most of the cropping guys do start. They, they go to auto steer or they go to a white bar. And uh, those are all great things. But once you get to that point, you've basically got a computer in your tractor. And uh, I think it behooves everybody to, to take advantage of the, what that brings as far as other capabilities. Um, at Southview Farm this past year, um, we took it up a step and we tried to, in the forage side of things, take advantage to, of something that the, the crop guys on the grain side have had for a long time, and, and that's yield monitoring. Um, we put a yield monitor on the John Deere forage shopper we have. Um, it gives us two benefits. Obviously, we, we have a good idea of what the yield is, and we have a very good idea of what the moisture is now, which uh, everybody knows is critical when you're putting up a forage. Um, my interest as the crop um, planter on the farm is uh, a little, goes a little further than just inventory purposes. All I want to know what areas of each field are, are my best areas. I want to know what areas are never going to perform up to average. And then I want to be able to break them down and apply nutrients in such a way that uh, I don't over apply those underachieving areas and I can concentrate my resources on, on those areas where I get the greatest return. Um, these are principles that dairy uh, personnel have been using on the herd side for years and I think they apply as much uh, on the crop side. Uh, being the first year that we've had uh, the yield monitor I haven't gotten a whole lot of feedback on it yet, but I have worked with other farms that have had them. Uh, I've worked with a lot of crop farms that have multiple years of, of grain data. And once you get that data and can get it analyzed, it becomes very clear where you want to concentrate those nutrients. I guess those are the two things. I, I mean, we, we've used... Um, uh, fields and crops uh, that John talked about, I've probably used that on and off for 10 years. Um, record keeping in your crop side has traditionally been done with notebooks and uh, that fall out of pockets and get lost once you get that on the, in a computer where you can easily recall and, and sum things up, it, it makes making decisions that much easier. And as we progress down this road to technology, just like RFID, um, we're going to get to the point where, where yield information gets automatically um, entered and makes the whole process that much simpler. Excellent. Carl, I see you jotting a lot of notes here. Is it uh, the things you want to take, the areas you want to want to explore here? It's Mike. Can you hear me now? So, yeah, there's certainly some common themes that are starting to, to develop here, right, in terms of uh, Lindsay and Peter trying to understand what's going on with individual cattle and be able to track uh, their performance and what, what um, practices they've applied on the cattle. And, and Dave has the same issue on the field side of things. Uh, Dave, you didn't mention manure, but I assume uh, some of those man being able to track where manure goes is, uh, is an important piece as well or a potential area for technology. So I assumed we were getting to future applications at some point. Uh, I, I think that's a huge one. And so we'll cover that a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. Um, and another question I would throw out to, to, to the folks from the panel is if you were starting from scratch, what would you, what would you suggest someone would pick up first? So Dave on the crop side, so 
I think most, as I mentioned before, most guys are going to get started on the crop side as, for guidance purposes, whether it be auto steer or just give the guy that's operating a tractor a way to, uh, to manually follow a light bar. But as I said, to do that nowadays, you're basically putting a computer in there. Almost all the systems available nowadays can be upgraded. So uh, that's where you'd want to start. Um, being that I'm on the supply side, I guess I'd, I'd encourage you to start with a, um, a really sharp pencil and uh, poke guys like me with it regularly for information about what are you buying, what are you getting from this new technology, this new system, um, how will you use it, what information will you get, who's going to use it. Go through all those calisthenics before you, you uh, decide to purchase something. And then whoever you get it from, particularly if it's not from me, um, be sure to, to hold our feet to the fire and make sure that you're getting all the things we told you you could get when you stop at the booth. Um, that's, um, I think, as I look over the arc of time where I've just watched technology, there are a lot of things that have come and gone, and some of them for good reasons because they, they didn't work. You know, I, someone adopted something and said, let's see if it works, and they said it didn't. So they, they put it to the side, and that's a good thing. But I, I think there's some technology that does work that is good that um, didn't get implemented just because we didn't, uh, we didn't make a good enough contract with, with the producers to make it work and to, to have an understanding at both ends about what you're buying, what, when it'll get there, who's going to use it, and how we use it. So just go through all of that um, as you're evaluating technology. Uh, I would recommend some sort of a computerized record system. You know, uh, for example, we use Dairy Comp, and you, you have to start with the basics. You know, your has got to be in in your Dairy Comp or you know other computerized system. Um, set up your protocols, plug John a lot to get things situated before you start any sort of electronic ID system. Um, before I answer that, I just wanted to, to add one thing I, I sort of forgot to add, add when I was uh, talking about the heat time, and that is being a dairyman myself, I, one of the things that was most important to us was reliability of the system. If you're going to have a system that's going to give you heat detection, you got to have it every day reliably, and the system over three years has worked very, very well. Every cow I deed every day without a hitch. And uh, it, it's been really outstanding from the, that side of things. So that was, that was job one for us to make sure we had a system that was going to work and we weren't playing with and fixing because there's enough to do with, with using the system, let alone babysitting the system. So we're very, very happy with it from that side. Um, as far as the technology that you should adopt first, it, it's, I guess I would say every farm is different for sure. And the, the technology that would bring you the biggest return on your dairy is different than your neighbor and everybody else. And so to identify that area is always the challenge for the dairyman, for us and everybody else. What, where's the weak link? Where are you going to get the biggest return? And to identify that, I think, is, is your first job. If it would be uh, um, something in the reproduction area, um, maybe ultrasound, uh, maybe heat time, but um, I think, you know, if I have a piece of advice, it would be make sure that, that you have identified the correct technology that's going to bring you the biggest return. And then I think what John said was really good. You've you got to have a champion for that technology, um, that person that's going to kind of drive it home and get excited about it and be the cheerleader for everybody else to adopt it and bring it down the road so that it can return as it's supposed to. Okay, very good. So, so as we walk around, as you guys walk around the show, um, as you read magazines and see things, I mean, there's more, I, I think the, the array of technology, the array of things that are going to be available to you as potential tools and producers are, are going to grow. I mean, I, I mean, how many of you thought 15 years ago you'd be carrying around as, as much technology as sits on your smartphone or your phone in your pocket right now? Um, uh, so what, what, I guess, I'd like to go on the panel again here, what one to two things right, that you're, are you thinking about looking at in the next year, a couple of years, or whatever? Are there, are there some things that come to mind that, that you're kind of thinking about watching out there, maybe wondering if that might be 
a good fit for your particular operation. Pete? Um, I would say we've adopted quite a bit of technology in a short period of time. Um, for us, I think it's making that work more effectively, return better for us. Um, so the three parts of that would be uh, our GPS technology. We're doing some of what Dave talked about. We're using zone tillage, planning on the slot, um, and developing that to get higher yields, uh, maximize inputs. We're, we're working a lot with that. We're just, you know, that's second year for us. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to do things better, as Dave was talking about, and maximize yields there. Uh, the, the automatic calf system, again, we're only since November with that. We're, we're monitoring calves very closely with respect to, uh, to rates of gain and hip heights and those kind of things. So when that data begins to come in, we'll be doing that on a constant basis to, to change feeding programs and strategies in order to uh, maximize returns there and, and continue with the heat time program to tweak that to uh, tweak that so we um, continue to improve reproductive efficiency. So Pete, who's the champion on your farm? Um, my brother Mike is the champion for sure on the crop side. He's the one that manages that. Uh, really excited about that technology. Um, he's the one that brought that forward. And I'm more on the dairy side, so the dairy stuff is, I'm the cheerleader for that side. Okay. Excellent, Lindsay. Uh, so we're strongly looking into the future for uh, parlor scanning system for the RFIDs. There's various types. Um, you know, we're trying to work within the system. Lindsay, hold it closer, please. Sorry, it's these trying to hard. work within the system that we have, uh, which is always. I think that's the biggest struggle is trying to retrofit. Um, <clears throat> we would love to be able to put sort gate system in, but. Like he said, did you really think, you know, 10, 15 years ago that you'd have this technology where animals could be automatically sorted without people? Um, so, there, you know, there's a lot of space requirements to go into that and tons of retrofitting. Um, but we're strongly, strongly looking into you know, the various types of sort systems, the scanning systems for the parlors, uh, and trying to work within, you know, within the stipulations that we have right now. And I think that's, that's the hardest thing is trying to think far enough ahead when you're trying to put, put a new system in and sometimes, sometimes the technology just isn't there when you're trying to put the things in and it, you know, kind of goes with, with, with technology and you know, the times and stuff. But um, the, the biggest one, and I think that will probably be a real you know, immediate change would be the scanning systems. Uh, those can be pretty well adopted to you know, multiple types of parlors, multiple types of ID systems. Um, and like, like we were talking about earlier is you need to sit down when you're putting something in. You, it's, technology can be quite expensive, you know, and sometimes it's great and, you know, make my life easier, but will it actually pay for itself in the end? Um, you know, so, so you need to sit down and, you know, check some balances when you're putting these systems in. So how do you evaluate that? Um, well, we're meticulous record keepers. So you know, even though we're a large dairy, everything is down to the penny. So, you know, a lot of times either, you know, we can work with new companies um, such as our feeding system. You know, we were like, hey, we'll try this. We'll do a lot of the leg work, um, but you got to help us out, too. Uh, as, you know, such as our, our cattle systems, you sit down, you know, it's say it costs X, men, X amount of dollars. What do we need to get out of that? You know, can we, will it cut out um, some employees' jobs? You know, can we move them to other places? Um, you know, specifically the sort system, a lot of our herdsmen, that's all they do is sort cows all day long. So think, you know, we could probably get, you know, not have five less people on the herd because these cows can be automatically sorted themselves. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Peck. John. So it, I think there's a lot of opportunity for integration of the different information systems that we have existing already on the dairy farms. A um, couple of things, as Dave mentioned, harvest monitors. Um, we have harvest monitors um, that presumably that data will go into a database for managing our crops. But also we feed those crops to our dairy cows and we have feeding software that has the ability to manage inventories, but we don't really have a clear path to easily get those inventories from, from our harvest monitor into our feeding monitoring software. And, I think integrations like that where we have data 
in different places in the operation where we can bring it together and help make decisions with it. Um, our consumables that we use on the dairy, um, whether it's uh, drugs or uh, just regular consumables, uh, we don't really have a great way to integrate that for an inventory piece, and I think that's going to become as, as how we treat our cows continues to become more and more visible and important. That's going to be more and more important to us as we go ahead. So looking for places that we can integrate, I think that's a real opportunity for us, um, A, to be more efficient and, and productive, and, and B, just to tighten things up and make it easier for people to use the data. Along those lines, um, I think looking at the systems as they grow in complexity, making sure there's good, consistent feedback when something breaks. There's, there are tons of disparate systems um, on a dairy farm, and um, we depend on people or happenstance to know when they break, or we see the, the consequence, and then we fix the problem. If we can get a little closer to that, I think there's a lot of benefit for us as, as we just go day to day doing things. So those are, are just two quick thoughts. So Carl mentioned uh, manure management. That's uh, one place I'd like to use technology to improve. Currently, as in I would guess most of the uh, farms out there right now, it's a paper method. Um, the guys out there spreading the loads or, or running the drag lines or recording how much and then coming in and that information eventually made, makes it onto our computer as long as that piece of paper doesn't get lost. Um, once again, these uh, technologies where we have a computer in the tractor, those computers in almost every case are capable of, of running spray equipment. Well, when you're applying manure, basically what you're doing is a sprayer operation. So these systems can all be used to record what amount of manure at what rate went where. Um, I'm planning on starting to implement that on, on at Southview Farm. It's already being used in several different farms, and, and that's just the, the start. Um, obviously, any of you who have dealt with the CAFO rules and regulations know there's certain places you shouldn't be spreading any manure. There's certain places that can't get the same rate as others, and you're relying on a set of maps or verbal communication to get that point across to whoever's running the tractor. Um, I'm sure you all realize that's less than perfect. So we now have a display in these tractors if we've got GPS where we can enter that information in and the operator can look at the display and, and know whether he's supposed to be there or not and if he is, what rate's supposed to be applied. Uh, finally, um, once, once we get to the point where these fields are broken down and we know what areas are better, what areas are worse, we can vary the rate of manure that goes out in accordance to that so we get the nutrients where we want them at the amount that's going to get used most efficiently so that's that's a big area of future improvement another one uh, that kind of goes along with that last statement is uh, variable rate technologies where we apply that more than just our manure at variable rates depending on what the field requires for but all of our nutrient implement nutrients in and seed rates can change. Um, that's going to take a few more years down the road. Um, harvest monitoring, yield monitoring is going to help with that process. There's other technologies out there that help you rate your field. Uh, one limitation of yield monitoring is you really ought to have three to five years minimum before you start putting a lot of faith in those numbers. Obviously a year like this year, year like last year, um, we all hope they're abnorm abnormal. Now, you don't want to make a whole lot of decisions based on an abnormal weather year. Uh, in order to speed the process up, there's uh, technologies where you can run a rig across a field and uh, electrically test the soil, give you a lot of information on the, what, what the nutrient carrying capability of that soil is, what the water holding capability that soil is, and you can start making variable rate decisions based on that information. So uh, those are two areas I think would be the immediate. Okay, excellent. 
you guys can, Carl I'm sure has some stuff he wants to jump in with here, but you guys can start thinking of your questions because we're gonna, we're gonna turn it over to you here in just a few minutes, so Carl. Yeah, thanks Tom. I just wanted to build a little bit on, on Dave's side of things and talk about the idea of your, your nutrient management plan, whether it's in a CAFO regulated context or not, that's really a, a fertility or manure prescription. And um, what some of the things that are coming down the pike here are actually gonna allow as, as Dave said, on screen folks in the tractor are gonna be able to identify, hey, this is an area where I have to shut the spreader off. And that will already be programmed in and will show up on the screen and the operator just has to shut the spreader off or turn it on. And maybe we can even get that um, even, even more um, automatic than it, than it currently is. I, another thing Dave touched on, and, and I don't know if any eyebrows raised in the room, but I, I can imagine talking to some farmers who may not be real excited about having pretty good documentation about how much manure went where exactly in a field. And maybe some of you can imagine people not liking that idea in some cases as well. And I just want to bring up a, a comment about that. Um, a year ago, a farm uh, that I'm aware of had, uh, had a, a challenge with a, a, a neighboring well. and. Um, of course, it was a CAFO farm, and the question was, well, where, what was your plan and were you following it? And in fact, that farm did have um, um, detailed maps of their manure rate and the application areas and, in, and actually helped that farm to prove to DEC that they were following uh, what they were supposed to be doing. So that, 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 uh, that knife cuts both ways, I guess. And so it could be a compliance and a risk management tool um, as well as maybe documenting non-compliance if that's how you're functioning. So I just wanted to throw, throw that out as a couple of concepts here. Questions? Questions from you guys out there? Yes. Larry. A lot of times you really don't have a good estimate of whether it's profitable or not. It's hard to estimate whether an ID system is profitable or not because you use it in so many scenarios. So I guess the question is, how do you make a choice between all these different technologies? Okay, who wants it first? We'll let multiple of you have a crack at it. It's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, the, the hard side of the numbers is we know what it's going to cost. So that we can, we can all figure that out. Um, it's tough, and Lindsay talked about that, you know, with theirs, you know, they right down to the penny. And it, it's always a challenge because the other side's soft. So you're, you're trying to rely on what's out there and what information you can gather from the supplier and others and what the potential benefit is to your dairy. And like I mentioned before, trying to identify your weak link, that's what we try to do, what's gonna give us the biggest return or where the greatest need is on our dairy. And hopefully, you know, we've, we've made a, a reasonable assessment of the technology and what it might return us. You know, we, it, it's, it's a challenge, no doubt about it, because that side is, is often unknown with new technology. Um, and a lot of times it comes down to um, who wants that technology on the farm and how bad they want it. Lindsay, can hit it? Dave, who wants, who wants next? Whoever. Uh, like he hit it right right on the head. I think it, it varies so much between each farm and you know identifying your weakest link is is the first and biggest step. I think applying different technology is going to be different for for every farm. Um, and as always, I think who who of that partnership wants it can be a major decision factor as well. Dave, John. Well, it's one of the questions when I'm. Uh, I'm on the uh, receiving end of that question an awful lot when I'm working with agronetics. Um, and it's, it is real hard because it does depend on an awful lot of variables that change with, with every farm. But you, these other guys nailed it right on the head. You gotta identify the area in your farm 
that needs that technology that can really benefit from it. But one thing I would add as far as the equipment um, that I was talking about earlier going in the tractor is you'd be surprised about how many other things that you can find that that technology will help you with that you never even thought of when you initially purchased it. So um, keep an open mind. That initial pur purchase cost can be uh, a shocker, but if you really start working through the labor implications, through the fuel saving implications, and through possible regulatory um, problems avoided, um, I think those numbers start working out for you. I think that's something that we can expect suppliers to help with is that planning process and expectation process. Um, as Pete said, there's a lot of soft things that you can't really, you don't have control over, you're sort of making assumptions about. But the, whoever you're purchasing um, your new technology from should be able to say with a degree of certainty, this is what the product does. Um, I, I guess short of saying you're going to get another three pounds of milk per cow, which if we got that every time somebody drove in the driveway and said that, we'd all need more bulk tanks. But um, whoever, when you're purchasing that, they should be able to say, this is what you'll do better. This is, this is how this can help. And it ought to be part of a conversation that they have with you as they, as they work through that selling, buying process with you and, and planning. And um, I will say from that side, from, from the provider side of the equation, um, the information that, that we get from those interactions um, improves the product, improves the delivery, and helps us be better at, at predicting those expectations as well. So, um, it's a benefit on both sides as we go through that. Yeah, if I could make a, a comment on that or two. Not everything, obviously, is an economic decision. And again, from an environmental compliance standpoint, as we look going into the future and applying more adaptive management to various parts of the field, as Dave mentioned, let's, let's try to push the parts of the field. It's just like we're pushing the cows that have the capabilities. Let's push the parts of the field that have the capabilities to yield and let's maybe pull back on the areas that, that don't have those same capabilities. As we identify those areas, then we have to figure out, well, what kind of treatments are we gonna apply there? I mean, is it more nitrogen, is it potash, or what combination? And we're gonna, we're gonna need to be able to test and evaluate those practices that we're implementing. And the technology to be able to write prescriptions for variable rate nitrogen, for example, or potash or whatever um, we need in those areas is going to be, I think, uh, have tremendous value and impact. And think about that on the manure side as well. So if we can um, reasonably justify more manure in parts of the field than others, um, they may also help us um, get manure um, better applied in the places where it's needed and where the crops can better utilize it as well. So a number of pieces, I think. Uh, one more thing, I think about how much time we spend on dairies at least thinking about variety selection and we think about yield and the quality and all those things and, and I would say without a yield monitor right now, I'm not sure we are, are maximizing our ability to really assess those real guesses that we make about hybrid selection. So I think uh, yield monitors properly calibrated and maintained um, to help us get relative yield for corn silage, for example, will we'll provide lots of opportunities to better select hybrids and, and to manage them better going forward as well. Okay, more questions? Steve Eicher. Go to heat detection. No. The people selling the activity monitors have made some pretty good claims about heat detection. If they're good enough, shouldn't you be able to eliminate your pregnancy exams? And do you have a guess of how many open cows they find on, a, on your normal preg exam? Is there any other questions? <laughs> We're, we're working on that. Um, yeah, they do make those claims. But I also said that we tried using that system without a shot program, and we weren't satisfied with that either. 
So, no, I don't, I don't think, again, I'm speaking about my herd, but I don't think our herd is, um, we're able to do that, to, to not use any you know, pregnancy diet. I don't think they would identify enough herds. I mean, we're, we're identifying, you know, a heat detection rate of, you know, mid-60s, and that's not going to get you to avoid any pregnancy diagnosis. So um, I, I don't think we can go there yet with those type of systems. I, don't, I, don't think, I think it's a cow issue, not necessarily a identification of heats. I think cows just aren't going to, you know, we have a lot of demands on cows. Their time, we're squeezing their time budget pretty tight. And the more we demand of them, the tighter it gets. And I just don't think our cows are, are showing us that kind of, kind of activity and able to do it. Hey, Joel, I'm going, to put, uh, I'm going to put our new superstar on the spot here. So Julio, uh, our, our, uh, again, Julio's worked a number of times in these types of systems also um, on dairies in Wisconsin during his research and things like that. So Julio, any comments here? Well, my comment is just to say that Pete is right on the spot. The technology is great itself. It's absolutely a cow issue. It's, it's the cow physiology that is limiting the systems. We do have data. Uh, we have tracked cows through ultrasound and, and hormone measurements after we uh, synchronized them to have them short estrus. And even cows, uh, you would expect you know, that they should show estrus and ovulate. There is about a third of them that do not. And there are different combinations of problems. There are the cows that do not show estrus and do not ovulate. Then you have the, the cow that shows estrus but does not ovulate. And you have the cow that you know, uh, ovulate without showing any estrus. So that's uh, clearly the case. And what we have seen uh, also is that uh, the same thing that you saw when the farmers remove completely the sink program six or eight months down the road, they are desperately asking to put the sink system back because it's just that percent of cows that will never show estrus and, and, and there is something to do. I think that the challenge is to find now uh, new strategies to deal with those cows and that's what we are going to be trying to do in the future, see what is the best way to maximize the fertility of those cows. But uh, um, I, I think that uh, you were right on spot there. Yep, Julio's going to be looking for research collaborators, too, as we go on as well, so dairies to work with. So uh, the, we'll the, or, the other thing, Tom, if, if you allow me to say something, as we were discussing before on how to evaluate the uh, potential uh, you know, bottom line or the profitability of these systems, we have been working for a while on developing models, uh, simulation models that deal with the data from your own farm and try to predict what will be the change in your reproductive performance when you switch to the use of the system or any sync program, whatever it is, and whether it will be profitable or not for you to make that change. I would like to say that those systems, you know, those kind of simulation models are around, they are not perfect at all, but at least they can give you a feeling or a good idea of what you know, the, the, the improvement or, you know, uh, the bottom line will be for making that change. So what Julio's talking about is while he was at the University of Wisconsin, he developed uh, a, a one of the tool or a tool that can be used to do some comparison work on the reproductive management side and compare competing programs, performance, and actually bring it back to the economics. And, and again, you know, obviously not perfect. You make assumptions, but, you know, he'll be continuing that kind of development work too and some of his stuff here at, at Cornell as well. So again, letting somebody say, okay, you know, what does this thing really look like? Um, and, and what is my opportunity? Okay, good, more questions? Yep, Marsha? Uh, to link the activities that you're monitoring to the person doing it so that you could also monitor the employees as well. Okay, great question. So just to make sure I got it right straight, you're asking about any ways to these technologies to, to not only monitor the cow, but essentially look at performance of employees or other things like that. Is that where you're going? Sure. The, okay. For instance, the person inputting the data or doing the activity that you're using the technology for, if their name or time in there could be a useful bit of information. Who wants it? Okay. Uh, so the question again, Steve, was basically, uh, 
you know, uh, any, any effort to link these systems together, not just that you'll get the cow, but also evaluate performance, other things of employees, um, et cetera. I think I'm tracking reasonably okay. Was that most of it, Pete? Yeah, I think so. The one spot where I would say we, we do that pretty effectively on our dairy is on the feeding side. Um, we have a feeding system that monitors, you know, what, what the cows are being fed by group and refusals and all that, but it also checks the accuracy of the feeder and gives us a report every day that, you know, prints out and sitting on your desk as far as what is the performance of your feeder. So I, I guess that was, that's one spot where you're, you're trying to have an effect on the cow side, but you're also monitoring the employee as well, and that's a very effective tool, I would say. So with, uh, by the way, with forage at a premium and, uh, and feed costs looking the way feed costs are going to look, how glad are some of you who have these feeding systems in place that, you, that you've got those things and you're really paying attention there? Pretty glad, I would think, right? So, okay. Lindsay? I just wanted to add to, um, I don't know if you could say, you know, maybe it's not necessarily a tech technological, you know, monitoring of the employees, but... You know, in our case, everything is checks and balances on our farm. So say someone does off-string slots in a certain group, they sign off. There is a record of everything that's done on the farm and who did it. So when we go back through, you know, they off-sync this group. Well, then we're pack checking and we're like, boy, you know, they're open or they didn't come in here, you know, something like that. We're like, oh, well, so-and-so did shots on that day. We'll sit them down and be like, hey, you know, do you understand what happened? You know, did, was there a mix-up? And so I think that with anything that you're doing on your farms is checks and balances is your, going to be your biggest advocate, you know, and being able to, you know, work more efficiently and you know, save yourself money in the end. Dave, John, anything to add? I know your question probably wasn't directed at field operations, but one of the reports uh, Agronetics can re produce from um, yield data is downtime and any amount of time that the uh, harvest equipment was not running. So it's a similar similar report to what you were asking about in, in, on the dairy side that can be done with, with any field operation as well. All of that GPS, I mean, GPS is time. I mean, that's how it works. And so every uh, measurement that's done using GPS is time stamped. The herd records standpoint, um, as Pete mentioned, feeding software, um, many of them allow you to, to log in as a specific user. Um, speaking specifically about Dairy Comp 305, parlor monitoring, um, assuming you know who's in the parlor milking, um, daily milking systems that we're connected to. We have a report that prints out after each milking that, that is essentially a, a record of how the milking went. Did we get as much milk as we wanted? Did it start and stop on time? We can have a graph uh, that shows us when each unit was attached. So we can monitor our protocols being followed as we understand them. Uh, Dairy Comp 305 has the ability to have user level logons so we can assign specific things that certain users can do. Um, pocket Cal Card and the RFID technology that Lindsay talked about there's actually a time stamp and a pen stamp um, for each time we identify a cow and how we identify that cow, whether she was scanned in with, a, with an RFID scanner or whether we touched her cow number to get her off of the list. So while that's not a user level, that is, again, um, monitoring process control. What time did we start? What time did we stop? Did we get within four inches of that cow um, to do the job we needed to do? So there's some of those things that are being built in um, again, for process control and, and just making sure that the protocols that we lay out get followed as we, as we work. Okay, any other questions? Carl, anything to... Just wanted to follow up, I guess, a little bit on Marsha's question. It sounded like you were asking, are there formal mechanisms for tracking performance that are also tied into these cow or field performance. And it sounds like the answer to that is really no, but you've, that information that you're collecting can indirectly be used to evaluate some pieces of performance. And it sounds like, like a lot of this aspect of technology 
our ability to exploit it is limited by our management time or our need. Pete mentioned that, well, we adapted technology based on a particular need we identified on our farm, and we, we realized that technology could help us maybe with our repro piece. Um, but there's all, there all sorts of, I think, fallout opportunities there that people really haven't, we haven't really begun to exploit them. And I know on the field side, of we, we all sit around and think a lot about there's all sorts of opportunities and things we can measure on the field. Figuring out which ones are the right ones to go after is, is more the problem. So that's, it's just, it's just really interesting to me to watch. We have, we have a challenges in terms of what management time are we going to allocate to identifying technology, um, and then how do we exploit that technology. I, I have one final question for you guys, though. Um, and you all deferred on my question about what are the next two or three ones you would recommend or what should people get into first. But is it, it, now that you've adapted some pieces of technology or, or John, you, you watch your clients, I mean, is it, is it worth the management time to figure out which technologies to use on your farm, Pete, even though what you use may not be right for the farm down the road? Um, is it worth the, the time to figure out which to use and how to use it? I think it is for sure. sure, Carol. I think that uh, technology is, is going to be a huge part of the future in dairying. You know, we, competitiveness is going to depend a lot on your ability to adapt, adapt technology and the correct technology for your farm. And we've kind of beat that to death, but I think that's, you can't overstate that enough that it's different for every farm. And what works for one doesn't necessarily work for the other. And, uh, but I think spending the time to see where the next opportunity is, is paramount to your success down the road. Dr. Peck, from your perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree, you know, with Pete Moore on, on that. Um, uh, <laughs> Lindsay, who's the champion on your farm? <laughs> well, in such a large farm, there's so many different different routes. So I think, you know, on our crop side, there's um, my brother and another one of the managers uh, on the herd side. It's my husband is a major, major champion there um, and myself as well. It, okay. it, is it fair to say, I mean, so your business is in a different spot. I mean, you really couldn't function no. at all without, I mean, so it's not even a question of no. do I invest in management time in your position, yeah. it's I couldn't, we couldn't run our business. Well, I it. think it's required, you know, as managers and as supervisors, you know, it's required to, for you to want to do the best for, for our business. And I don't know if it, you know, personally as a time thing, you know, if I'm out doing something, you know, I'm out palpating or something, it's kind of mindless work. I'm thinking all the time, you know, and I think a lot of business owners are. So, I mean, it, 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 I don't. I think that it's you know a mute point to say you know is it necessary you know or not you know of course it is. <laughs> Dumb question, she said. Okay, I get it. Okay, John, we'll work around this kind of the parting comment here from everybody. John, but I think the uh, the thing is that early adopters get the biggest bounce out of anything new, and you can see that across the arc of the business, um, and. Probably if you asked any of the people sitting next to me if they tried something early on and, and then dropped it because it didn't work. Um, so I, I think two things, early adopters get the biggest benefit and the smart early adopters know when they've got something that's not working for them and they put it away quickly. So that whole process of make a smart decision, evaluate it, do a, a tough evaluation on it and only stick with it if it's good. Dave, you get the last word, I think. Well, and the one I completely agree with the rest, and it applies to field crops as well. And the one other thing, when you talk about manure, is going to be regulatory issues. So you know those regulations are going to do nothing but, but get more strict, and you're going to have to do whatever it takes to be able to prove you're doing the job the way, whether we like it or not, the government says we should. So... This is a technology, or technology, I think, is developing that's going to help that. Okay. Well, uh, we've got a couple things to do before you guys get, uh, other things to run the program before you guys get your delicious beef sandwiches and pies and all that kind of good stuff. But let's, uh, let's thank our panelists very, very much for their time today. 
And I, I think, again, we've got a couple other things we're going to do with uh, a, a couple presentations, but uh, um, I think the panelists are willing to, to hang out here through lunch anyway and, uh, and answer more questions for you. So again, um, thank you very much. Okay. Cliff, I'm going to turn it back to you, and we're going to do a little, uh, little change in technology here. Thanks, Tom. Kind of, uh, working together, so we got, we got um, the power back. So they're all kind of working together, and if, uh, if, if you could see my slide, I have a lovely photo of uh, Wayne Pacelli. He's the CEO of HSUS. Um, you know, he's he's very uh, mainstream guy. They're using mainstream tactics. And here's a quote from him. It says, we're not telling people to be vegetarians. We're urging them to exhibit greater decency. So how can anyone argue with that? You know, they're really going after the mainstream appeal. And they're looking at different ways to try to, you know, kind of uh, bend and groove the different things that we do. Um, I would say, you know, there's a few things that we've learned with some of these happening in our area that we, uh, we want to try to, you know, just convey that to you guys. And I think the biggest thing is if there is a video, you know, once it goes public, no matter what it is or where it is, it's kind of difficult to ease consumer concerns because what takes place is there's, you know, splicing and dicing of the video that just, it's, it's stuff that it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, to have people who aren't involved in this business on a daily basis wrap their head around. Um, and if there is something that takes place in that video, you know, and it's something that's not in line with what your expectations are on your farm or your standard operating procedures, then you got to figure out a way to address that act and, and figure out, you know, just explain to folks this is something that, you know, we, we don't do, we don't normally do. Um, you know, you've got to recognize that, I think I told you, HSUS, the tactics that they're using today, it's very much mainstream. So. You know, we used to rely on the laurels that, oh, it's, you know, somebody else, not our industry is given this information, but um, these days, you know, that's something that we've got to be careful of. So just talking about, you know, the different programs that are available that are out there here in New York State, there's a Nice Chat program. There's also the FARM program, the farm program, uh, two different programs that you can participate in. Uh, from a dairy perspective, and there's, it doesn't have to be extremely formal. Just having standard operating procedures on the farm and communicating with employees is, you know, one of the biggest things that you can do. Um, and we talk a little bit about employees when we, when we t go through this process. You know, the biggest asset that you have are the employees um, on your farm. And in many of these cases, what's taking place is uh, the videos are created by people who were unknowingly hired. Uh, you, you know, they come in. They might have a different story than other people have had. They might actually show different ID than, you know, you or I, as a, we would normally show our license. So just, you know, kind of be aware and, and look for different things that might throw up a red flag. Um, you know, your employees, like I said, on the farm are your biggest asset. And just make them aware of this sort of thing happening. And if they see something, to let you know. Uh, you know, be accessible, let you know, let others know, and just kind of have a plan in place. I'll talk a little bit about that. As far as security, I mean, I think a lot of this is stuff that you already do. To the extent that you can, I mean, on a dairy farm, it's pretty hard to drive people to one spot, one point of entry. But I think, you know, by and large, you can just have people be aware um, of what's going on, who should be on the farm, who shouldn't be on the farm. To the extent that you can introduce your employees to the group of, you know, advisors that you use, that's great. And if they see anybody that's, you know, not somebody they recognize, they're letting you know. Um, and then just, again, basic stuff. Watch your back and involve even, you can even go to the point where you're, you know, introducing yourself to local law enforcement and just saying, hey, come to my farm, check it out. And if you've got a concern, certainly get them involved. Are you prepared? This, this doesn't need to be, uh, again, very formal. You can just literally go home today, take out a piece of paper, and just write down some stuff. It's much easier to think crit critically when you've got time than when you're in a stressful situation. So just walk through, you know, what, what, would, what would you do if this were to happen to you? What would the steps be that you do? Um, like I said, there's a ton of resources back there, right where that um, woman is with the white shirt. Right there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's the flip cards and a number of other things back there that can kind of help you uh, walk through this process. But you might want to go through something as simple as writing down the different awards you've gotten, milk quality awards, environmental awards. Are you involved in the Nice Chat program? Are you involved in the FARM program? Uh, you know, kind of keep a handy list of the third-party people that you work with, your vets, your nutritionists, uh, you know, co-ops, milk procurement entities, uh, your milk inspector, your hauler, um, and other farms that you can just use as third-party um, advocates for you. And just think through, I think one of the biggest things that you could use, excuse me for a minute, 
is this, this little book back there put together by our checkoff organizations, your checkoff dollars? It's got some value-based messaging in there that's super simple. Uh, we use this all the time when we're dealing with reporters. It just, it just helps, helps you when you're in a stressful situation, kind of just put the, the things in the back of your mind on what to say. So uh, it doesn't need to be very formal. Just think through, you know, what would you do if this were to happen to you? And again, if, if it does, you don't want to panic. You know, you, you kind of pull this out. You think through it. You've got a, a list of people on your farm that are ready to deal with this. Um, certainly one of the biggest things that, that you will have happen is uh, you're probably going to get a phone call from someone in the media. Uh, the best thing to remember with them, sorry, Joel, is that you don't have to talk to them right away. You can kind of put them off. You know, get yourself ready and organized and, and prepared to deal with this. Don't jump the gun. You know, you try to control the situation. Um, and I think the other big thing is uh, there's a series of meetings that are taking place. There's one next Thursday uh, in Batavia, New York, uh, and one Friday in Saratoga. Um, so some of you may have already attended, but those are open and available. They start usually about 7 p.m. Uh, they get done 7.30. They're done at 9. And there's a larger presentation like this and some uh, real-life examples and different uh, things you can do to kind of develop a program uh, on your farm. So uh, I would highly encourage you to take one of these. And there's also a pocket card back there that allows you to throw some phone numbers on the back. Um, it walks you through what to do should you get a phone call, because nine times out of ten, if this sort of stuff happens, you're going to get a phone call at like 4 p.m. on a Tuesday, and they'll say, hey, we've taken an undercover video on your farm, and we're going to release it tomorrow at 8 a.m. So this, this little packet here just kind of helps you uh, get the basics uh, of what you need to do in order and a, a spot for you to write down some key phone numbers. So with that, I'll shift it back to you guys.